Why did three men vanish without trace from the lighthouse on this lonely Scottish island? What was their fate? Is this a photograph of a mermaid, the weird half-woman, half-fish of seafarers' tales? This egg was laid by an extinct bird found only in Madagascar. How did it come to be buried 4,000 miles away on a beach in Australia? The liner that brought me to Sri Lanka in 1956 docked just below this hotel, the Grand Oriental, here in Colombo. This is one of the great harbors of the world. From here, ships embark on voyages all over the Indian Ocean. It's a sea I've come to love, and I've spent hours exploring its depths. In fact, I celebrated my 75th birthday, 100 feet down, five miles off the coast here. The oceans of the world hold many secrets, weird creatures, perhaps even our old friend, the great sea serpent. But there are many other mysteries much nearer the surface. Seafarers tend to be good observers, but when they say they've spotted a mermaid, can we really believe them? These two scientists take mermaids seriously, but their experiments on one of Canada's Great Lakes have convinced Ermgard Schroeder and Waldemar Len that the sailors' sightings are illusions created by mirages. I can, uh, we get a nice faint, but nice mirage of Willow Island, I can actually identify the trees on it. Len has photographed mirages to study the phenomenon. Here, the setting sun is distorted like an abstract painting. This looks like a UFO, but it's really the upside-down image of the island beneath. A mirage is an optical illusion created when light rays are bent in freak weather. A mermaid sighting in a Viking saga struck a chord with Ermgard Schroeder. Well, the mermaid was described as a very tall monster, uh, and it appeared to rise straight out of the water. It had a shoulder, neck, head, eyes, mouth, and from the shoulders down, it seems to narrow down. In other words, this animal had never been seen from the waist down. In my opinion, uh, sightings of mermaids and mermen are uh, bound to be mirages of common objects. They could be mirages of, uh, I guess the best ones would be uh, sea mammals, like whales, walruses, uh, seals. If there happens to be a good mirage active at the time, this will elongate their head into a tall, thin object. Once we had the theory of the merman fairly clear in our minds, we thought we'd better get some photographic evidence that such things could actually happen. So I began to take field trips to Lake Winnipeg. I was very fortunate in getting a, a photograph of a boulder that was very strongly refracted upward into an elongated shape that looked almost exactly like the shapes I had postulated theoretically. At the time I took the picture, I didn't even know that it was a boulder. I just took the picture. Subsequently, I was able to identify where it was by recording the line of sight. We walked up close to it and we took another picture of it. And it was indeed a relatively small boulder, about perhaps a meter in diameter. The mirage distorted the stone to look like a head and shoulders easy to mistake for the mermaid described in the ancient writings. In modern day, there haven't been very many reports of mermen in the North Atlantic and the Greenland Sea. I think part of the reason is that the sailors are far too high off the water. I think a Viking sitting in his longboat would be just at the right elevation. More modern sightings of mermaids in Papua New Guinea lured this American halfway across the world. Explorer Tom Williams organized an expedition and recorded it on his home video. The weird tales of the locals spurred him on. Talk about her skin and the contrast uh, from, upper from, and lower. From the head uh -huh. down above here, it's part of the body, yeah. and the in the body. Yes. From here to down, down stasis, fish. Uh-huh, yeah. How about arms and hands? Uh, with arms, hands, head and eyes. Uh -huh. what, is, what were her hands like? Look like a human being. When we first arrived in New Guinea, after dropping anchor in a bay, after being there 10 minutes, we saw this graceful tail break the surface of the water and slide slowly under. It was a very graceful whale-like tail, but not the size of a whale. And we saw a rolling back break the surface, after which the tail would break up and slowly 
the sin. Of course, we were beside ourselves with, with joy when we saw this. And a little bit later, a, a native came up in a rowboat and told us in Pigeon that yes, yes, this was the Ilkai, the legendary animal that we'd heard about. Williams suspected this creature, the dugong, had inspired the stories, but the locals said no. There is a different word in the general language for dugong, and in New Guinea pigeon, there is a distinction between dugong and a mermaid as well. We ran into several people whom we interviewed in pigeon who described it as ladyfish. The pigeon word for dugong is bomakau balong solwara, which is saltwater cow, literally translated. And they told quite convincing tales of an animal that was in no way a dugong. She has breast, long hair, arms, and lives in the sea. And he said, there's a man and a woman and a baby out there. But William's suspicions were soon confirmed when this sad corpse washed up on the beach. Locals had sworn it was a ladyfish, but there could be no mistaking a dead dugong. So why were the mermaid stories ever taken seriously? Well, it's probably like any sort of men's association anywhere in the world. Somebody tells a story, and nobody's really sure whether he's lying. And so somebody comes back with another story. And pretty soon there's this club. And if you don't have a story, you're not a member of the club. So you don't call each other for lying. You just add to the stories. And pretty soon everybody winds up trapped in this belief system. Um, it, it happens in bars around the world. So why not in New Guinea? At Edinburgh's veterinary school, the x-ray team has a most unusual patient. Could this yeah, tiny creature be a baby mermaid? One of these before, but do you reckon? Maybe a small cat or a lizard? Try it as a small cat and I'll see if that works out. David Heppel wants the x rays to tell him whether this strange carcass is real. The wiring of the fingers, fairly thin wire here. An avid mermaid hunter, he has seen fakes before. Sadly, this is another, made of wire and plaster. Yeah, I think we see there's absolutely no trace of any skull. No, inside no. the head. So this idea of them being a small monkey at the front, I think we can certainly discount certainly that. Certainly no sign of any bones yeah. in there. At the Museum of Scotland, David Heppel is curator of mollusks, but he still finds time for his hobby, collecting eyewitness stories of mermaids. He's netted a rich haul from Scottish seas. There are actually more sightings and reports of mermaids from Scotland than from anywhere else in the world. One of the best documented sightings of a mermaid from Scotland was that from Thurso in Caithness on the north coast at the very end of the 18th century. And the witness there was a local schoolmaster. In the Times of the 8th of September 1809, he wrote, in the course of my walking on the shore at Sandside Bay, my attention was arrested by the appearance of a figure resembling an unclothed human female sitting on a rock, combing her hair. And it stayed on the rock for three or four minutes before it slipped back into the sea and he noticed that he had a fishy tail. Apart from several stories of sightings, there is also from Scotland a story of a rather remarkable capture of a mermaid in the Shetland Islands in the year 1833, when six fishermen found a creature they didn't recognize entangled in their lines. They were certainly intrigued by the fact that it had what seemed to be large human-like breasts. And it was light gray in color, pure white on the belly. And in this case, they say it had webbed fingers and the eyes were small and blue. Unfortunately, they didn't bring it back to port because it was giving these piteous cries and they also had the superstition that it was probably unlucky to capture a mermaid. After that, a sizable reward was offered for the capture of another one, but has not yet been claimed. In Australia, nine-year-old Jamie Andrick and his playmates made an extraordinary discovery in 1993 on their local beach. So great was the sensation, they promptly reburied their treasure, and it took a government minister to persuade them to reveal where it was. This was the cause of the fuss, a vast fossilised egg laid by the extinct elephant bird. For Jamie, the discovery meant celebrity status. The egg will go on display in the city, but for the kids at Cervantes Primary, a first-hand look at the fossil that has become Jamie's golden egg. But whether it lasts another 2,000 years is anybody's guess. What do you think, Jamie? Monica Koss, Seven Nightly News. 
On the other side of the world at London's Natural History Museum, prehistoric bird expert Cyril Walker is excited by the discovery too. Elephant bird eggs are really just like gold dust. There are only 27 specimens in the world. We are very fortunate to have 11 of them. They are really, really rare. A single elephant bird egg would have held two and a quarter gallons of yolk, 150 times as much as a chicken's. Without doubt, they're the largest egg you'll ever find. The largest animal, possibly, as well, as far as weight is concerned. The moa from New Zealand possibly stood a little higher, which we have a bone here, the leg bone. But the major thing that we have with the elephant bird, of course, is its size, hence the name elephant bird. Now, if we look at the thigh bone, which is this bone here, and compare it with the moa bone, one can start to get some idea of the actual size of this animal estimated at being somewhere in the region of 500 kilo, kilos or 1,000 pounds. The elephant bird lived only on the island of Madagascar off the southeastern coast of Africa. So how could its egg have travelled 4,000 miles to Australia? There are three scenarios that actually come to mind. The first one is that it could have been an Australian, native Australian bird, but the only animal that could have actually have laid such an egg became extinct 30 million years before we know that this egg was actually laid. The second scenario could be that the egg was washed out into the sea off Madagascar from here and was picked up on a current, of which there are several, that moved it across the Indian Ocean and eventually coming to rest somewhere in Western Australia just above Perth. My own idea is relatively simple. I think it was, in fact, on an East Indiaman, probably dating 16th, 17th, 18th century type stuff, would have gone round via the Cape up to Madagascar for picking up fresh fruit and vegetables before undertaking their journey over to the Far East. On the way, the ship possibly got pushed off course by gales and actually pitched up on the beaches of West Australia. The most amazing thing is that it actually was preserved whole on the beach and then being found by young children who could have destroyed it but didn't because they actually realized it may be of some importance. The Marshall College Museum in Aberdeen on the east coast of Scotland boasts a strange exhibit delivered almost to its door by the waters of the North Sea. It has always fascinated curator Charles Hunt. We're looking at a, an Inuit kayak that's been in the University of Aberdeen's possession for about 250 years. Um, it's made from four seal skins, very carefully sewn together. There have been various ideas about where the kayak came from. Kayakologists have suggested Labrador, they've suggested West Greenland, but the consensus seems to be that we have a kayak from the central part of the east coast of Greenland. The kayak's exhausted owner paddled up the mouth of the River Don over 250 years ago. He was an Eskimo who had somehow made the perilous journey from Greenland more than 1,200 miles. He died within days. The impact on the local people when they saw this, this hairy man come out of the sea in this very slight boat is very difficult to comprehend. People who probably never left their villages uh, suddenly to have this visitor from outer space arrive on their doorstep. But this was not the first time such people had been seen. Eskimos had made the journey to Scotland before. Sighted off the Orkney Islands in the 17th century, they had been accused of frightening the fish. I think it is highly unlikely that a kayaker could paddle his way from Greenland to Scotland, covering 1,200 miles of high sea. That is the shortest distance he would have to cover. It seems to me that it is somewhere between very unlikely and impossible that he made the journey by his own efforts. Whaling captains were known to bring Eskimos home as exotic souvenirs. In the 1720s, Pock and Keeperock were stars of the Copenhagen regatta. Seventy years earlier, these Greenlanders were kidnapped and posed for a painting in Norway. In Holland, this dried hand of an abducted Eskimo has only three fingers. The fourth was used as a bookmark. Danish and Dutch whalers bringing Inuit back reached such a peak at the beginning of the 18th century that they passed a law making it an offence uh, to, to, to kidnap Inuit. And it's quite possible that our Eskimo 
uh, was on board a Dutch or a Danish vessel where the captain suddenly got cold feet and put him overboard with his kayak and left him to drift. And this poor man turned up on our coast. This view reminds me that our planet should be called sea, not earth, because water covers three quarters of it. So much ocean, so much space for weird happenings and unexplained disappearances. Off Scotland, Coast Guard Alistair Smith is heading for the Flannan Islands, 14 miles from the nearest land in the wild North Atlantic. In 1900, another ship made this journey. She had come to relieve Flannan's three experienced lighthouse keepers. First mate Joe Moore climbed ashore, but soon came running back in terror. The light was trimmed, the living quarters were tidy, only two sets of oilskins and boots were missing. One chair was overturned in the kitchen, but the island was deserted. On shore, headkeeper James Duckett had lived in this house with his family. His daughter remembers the last time she saw him. My brother and I were playing out in the garden and we looked up and it was my father coming out. He was going back from his leave and he walked up the garden and lifted both of us and kissed us and walked away, shut the gate. And we stood and looked after him a minute or two. Watched him walking up the road. We lived in a house right at the sea. The sea was just across from us. And we ran after him shouting, Daddy, Daddy. And he tells him at the corner, the very corner, and walked slowly back, lifted us up again. So it looked as if he had some presentiment there was something going to happen. We never saw him again. That was the last time we saw him. People feared isolation had driven the men to madness or suicide. Others spread rumours that one had murdered the others before escaping. Some put it down to supernatural revenge for the destruction of the island's ancient chapel. There had been a storm for several days, which would lead to very high swell waves. Every seventh or eighth wave is often very much greater, and maybe perhaps one in a hundred or two hundred is of exceptional size. That crane pedestal had been damaged during the storm, and when the rescuers arrived several days later, the crane had disappeared. It had been completely swept away. It looks as if two keepers, the principal keeper and one other, went down just to check the southwest landing. The third man would have kept a weather eye out to sea, as he was a lot higher up, to see, keep an eye out for large swells coming in. I think he noticed a very large one coming in, ran out without putting on his sea boots and oilskins to warn his companions. But I think the, the wave came in and was sufficiently large to sweep all three of them off the landing and into the sea. The men from Edinburgh all came to see Mother. There were about five of them. And we were playing in the house at the time when the doorbell rang. When Mother opened the door, these men were all standing outside in the passageway come with the news of the accident to tell them that father and all the men were washed away. The corporate headquarters of the Atlantic Mutual Insurance Company holds the key to another mysterious disappearance. Uh, here at the Atlantic Mutual, we, we have kept uh, disaster books since 1852 uh, on through World War II. What we used to do was record handwritten every marine disaster that occurred throughout the world. Ted Henke is senior vice president of the claims division of the Atlantic Mutual. The old books in the library provide reminders of the company's illustrious past and of some of their unluckier clients. They also insured the cargo of a brigantine called the Mary Celeste. And to this day, the Atlantic Mutual staff can't be sure if the company should have paid the claim that was made on them when the ship disappeared. In November 1872, the Mary Celeste left New York with a cargo bound for Italy. Four weeks later, she was found adrift on the high seas. Her crew had vanished without trace. 
The story that you first get just doesn't make sense. You have a seaworthy vessel, uh, you have a cargo that's intact, you have a captain that is a part owner of the ship, uh, he's got his wife and his small daughter on board the ship. Uh, it doesn't make sense that they would leave the ship when the ship is fine. Another good reason for coming home safely was seven-year-old Arthur Briggs, who had been left with his grandparents in America. From the ship's log, the Atlantic Mutual could chart the Mary Celeste passage from leaving New York on the 7th of November until the 25th. Nine days after the last entry, she was boarded by the crew of the De Gracia. Strangely, this ship had been beside her in New York Harbor. The Mary Celeste was sailed to Gibraltar by De Gracia first mate Oliver DeVoe. He was met by suspicion. One question we would have asked ourselves is how likely is it that two ships berthed together in New York would meet in the middle of the North Atlantic 2,138 miles apart uh, by accident. And we would have gone back to New York and we would have found that the two ships, the De Gracia and the Mary Celeste, were berthed side by side. And there were some rumors, but unsubstantiated or on un, uh, no proof, uh, that the two captains had dined together the night before they left. Uh, I don't know what to make of that, but that's an interesting fact. It's interesting, you're looking at the uh, Mary Celeste through the eyes of sailors. So the first thing they look at is to see that the sails are in order and the riggings and all that. Uh, but then they begin to look below into the cabin to find things that, that just appear odd. Uh, everything is soaking wet inside, uh, but they're intact. There's, there's trunks full of clothes intact. There are provisions that they used to sail the ship. They ate the food that was on Mary Celeste, so it was full food. Uh, there was the impression the beds were not made. Now, they, there's speculation that this, whatever occurred, happened between 8 a.m. and noon. Uh, in that world, in that small uh, cabin, you don't leave your beds unmade, you, you, you tidy things up. Sailors by nature are very tidy people, and Mrs. Briggs, the captain's wife, was a tidy woman. She would have tidied up. The lifeboat was gone, but the only thing that they could tell that they took with them was some navigational tools. Um, they didn't even take their pipes, their smoking pipes, which is something every sailor in those days carried with him everywhere he went. Acres of print have been devoted to trying to explain the mystery. Perhaps there was an extraordinary accident that resulted in all on board falling into the sea. Or could there have been such a disease on the ship that death with the sharks seemed preferable? The best theory as to what happened has to do with the cargo they were carrying. They had 1,700 uh, barrels of alcohol, and when you go across the ocean, from time to time, barrels break and leak very likely that when they smelled that alcohol, they could have panicked. Uh, they could have even had been a little uh, influenced by the smell of the alcohol and maybe weren't thinking right. Uh, they maybe uh, grabbed the lifeboats, took a line, threw it over one of the railings or tied it to the mast or whatever, and drifted away from the boat to let the fumes clear up. Uh, and this, this could be the equivalent of uh, somebody locking their keys in the car door and oops, and there goes the ship. As it turns out, uh, there was a squall at that time, and once the tow line breaks, the people that are left in that lifeboat have absolutely no chance. In the 19th century, the company paid the claim against them. Would it have done the same today? If we had to prove this case today, we'd probably pay the claim. This falls into one of those categories where we suspect a lot, and we have a lot of suspicions, but we couldn't prove it. And if you can't prove fraud, you can't deny for fraud, and you pay the claim. I'm rather glad that we don't know exactly what fate befell the crew of the Mary Celeste because the answer might be boringly simple. I heard a story recently about a deserted luxury yacht found drifting in the Mediterranean. It turned out that its crew and passengers had all gone for a midnight swim and someone had forgotten to lower the ladder. <laughs>